of a project that has its roots in Yonkers is being showcased here in White Plains. Well, there are a number of reasons. First of all, we believe this project is a Westchester project and not just a Yonkers project. It's about paying tribute to people who worked here in Westchester, albeit in Yonkers, but have a history and a um, legacy that we salute. So it is a Westchester project, it is Yonkers, yes, but it is a Westchester project. I think also this place that you're in, um, the restored bank, it's a place where um, our board of trustees seeks to bring important, talented artists to the fore and also um, provoke discussion about important issues. And that is our tradition here at Arts Westchester. There are many, many people who have been part of bringing this project together. Um, I'd like to first to hear from the president of our board, Joe Oates from Con Edison. And Con Edison has been very generous in providing this opportunity for us to showcase the work of Vinnie Bagwell um, and get this project off to a good start. So Joe? Thank you, Jen. Thank you, everybody, for coming today. But most of all, thank you, Vinny, for the start of a wonderful project that's not just for the city of but for all of Westchester County. And I really do hope that uh, the project, as it moves forward, does spark some meaningful dialogue and conversation. And for Con Edison, the thing that we hope it does is uh, raise people's awareness of the important work that we have on the market. So, Vinny, congratulations. Project, and uh, we really do appreciate the work that you've done so well. Thank you. You know, he comes from Yonkers, but he really does care about the way the arts bring people together. And that's Ken Jenkins, our chairman of the County Board of Legislators. Thank you. 
did I fast as I could, like I had some slave workers chasing me. And I still to this day can't tell what possessed me, but that's all I can think that it was, that I was possessed. Because I could not stop hot tail me straight to that house of fire. By the time I get a quarter mile or so from me, I see big yellow flames shooting out the windows and puff of smoke. Black coming them flame, them flame. Now, I know that Moss Jefferson was up in state politics somewhere, because that had been the talk of late. How Andrew Jefferson had become this big wig in Alabama State fans. And he is high for noon. I also know that he had buried his first wife two years before, but died from that malaria disease. And that his new young bride was stuck up yonder in that burning temple. And all, all this is running through my head as I approached them flames of frickery. And all I could think was, well, I gotta get her. I gotta get her. Lord Jesus, somebody say, I gotta get her. And as I was running past the house trough, I grabbed two blankets and doused them in the water. I hauled up in that house and hollered, Mrs. Mrs. She coughed and screamed from up on the top floor of the two-story mansion. I lit up them stairs like a jackrabbit and see her stuck in the corner like she's in a daze or on that liniment drug or something. And I says to her, Mrs., you're going to have to walk with me if you want to live. And the poor thing just faint that way. She ain't never seen who was talking to her. She just collapsed right there in the corner. And that's when the room filled with fire and the whole floor gave way underneath me. Now, the rest of this here story what folk told to me, because I don't remember none of it on my own recollection. They say as I come walking out in the front door of the big house with the missus taped over my right shoulder in the wet blankets. Says I walked down to the trough, put both my feet in the wall, then laid the missus in the blankets, in the trunk with me. They said that my shoes and pants was on fire when I come walking out that house. And that there is a circle of light, like Moses by circling me as I was walking. I don't remember none of that. Now, thinking back to that day more than 60 years ago, I don't remember none of what happened except smelling that smoke, dropping that hole, and leaving that peanut patch. I remember walking into the big house in Holland, but after that, I don't remember none of it. But I'm telling you this here story from the porch of my own house, what the Mrs. Jefferson had built for me out of appreciation. And I'm telling you this story as I look down at both my anchors, which is ten shades lighter than the rest of me, because all the skin is burnt off of me. And I'm also telling you this, because everybody would know me called me Shadrach since the harvest of 1899. <laughs> Thank you, I'll have one more, if that's okay. Uh, and this, this story, this particular story, ladies and gentlemen, is about, I, again, I take poetic license with this particular story. Understand that, but I also, I want you to understand it is infused with a whole lot of actual facts. Um, during the Battle of Chattanooga, in, during the Civil War, the, the Battle of Chattanooga was won without getting hardly anybody fighting. There were very few gunshots, and still to this day, historians don't uh, have a clue as to why that particular city uh, was won so easily of all of the skirmishes. I mean, you got, I mean, skirmishes where thousands of people died during the Civil War. But this particular one, they don't understand how a city so big could have been uh, overtaken so easily uh, by the Union Army. Well, has anybody ever heard of the term easy as pie? Okay. Again, I take poetic license. This, poem, this piece is called Miss Betty Baker and Her Pie. It is an established fact that couldn't nobody get a bite of better baker pies without a tear running out their eye. Nobody. They say that a bite of a slice of one of Miss Betty Baker pies was as close as any man could come to heaven on earth. 
Says the pies are so good they make you moan when you eat them. That is what the master cooked to the big house of Master Josh Tobias Hamilton, who was may have the biggest landowner in all of Chattanooga. Master Hamilton was struck proud as a peacock at the mention of his shindig guy. They is known fine body as the toast of Tennessee because of the cooking of Miss Betty Baker. It is not certain the year Betty is born. It ain't never was established who Betty Baker was the child of. It ain't even was ever established where she is born. The only thing that is known for true is that if you enter a piece of one of Betty Baker's pies, you change. And you never be the same as before you enter. And you spend a goodness amount of time licking your, licking your lips and your fingers in the wake of it. Now, the fact of it was that at least once a month, Master Josh would set up Sizable, get a sizable offer for the sale of Betty Baker. Said there wasn't even no consideration in the way of that. He ain't never put a mind to sell it. As a matter of fact, Miss Betty Baker's cooking so good that everybody colored white free old barn would refer to her as Miss Betty Baker. Now it's unusual for a white to refer to any color as Miss. But it weren't the one in the whole county who didn't dress up if Miss Betty would respect and admiration because of her cooking, because there's just some godly about it. Now, this year's story was been handed down, and I can't stand by whether it's legend or for truth, because of one day. But I is certain that everybody in the entire Hamilton County is swear by it. And that is, that it was Chattanooga colored women, and Miss Betty Baker Pies was won the Battle of Chattanooga on June 7, 1862. They said the victory was already won for now shot the pie on the count of them pies. They said that the most time Miss Betty would cook, she'd cook for a great big old gap. They'd be 75 to 100 folks sometimes. Moss Hamilton would have confederates come over. She stoke up them big old ovens. Said she'd bake 10, may have 15 pies at a time in them big old things. The legend goes that on some Sundays, the whiff of her bitters in the air stopped folk to humming for miles around. Smell so good, have white folk humming Negro spirituals. <laughs> Miss Hamilton say that she is blessed by the Lord, and when she go up yonder, she gonna be the cook for Jesus. Well, by June of 1862, things had turned bad for Tennessee, for Hamilton County, and most all the Confederate states. War was hell. And the Union Army was starting to get the better of them great coats. The Hamilton plantation had done been took over by the blue coats, and Josh Hamilton had run off. Colors was deserting their slave quarters throughout the county and throughout the whole South for that matter. They was paddy rollers trolling every which way. Colors was having a hard time of it, and so were the whites. There's a whole lot of them suffering from the mystery of cramps, what with trains being robbed by bandits, Union and Red, and stations being hijacked. There's a lot of rations that never arrived to the place they supposed to. And the smell of food, the smell of food, was starting to arrive. There's a contraband by the name of Joshua Polk, who was a colored scout for Brigadier General James Neckley. And all he could talk about was Miss Betty Baker's apple pie sitting around the camp. Evening of June 6th, Joshua says to the general, If them Johnny get a whiff of them pie, then they won't be fit for fighting. <laughs> well, the general latched on to the notion and paid a visit to Miss Betty and asked her how fast she could whip up a mess of them pies. She told him that there weren't no apples left, but she had a goodness stock of pictures. At first night, Saturday morning, on June 7, 1862, Miss Betty and two of her cooks had them ovens stoked. And two hours after the cock crow, them women had baked up 20 pies. An hour later, they had 20 more ready. Now, just across the banks of the Tennessee was in camp Major General Edmund Kirby Smith with more than 200 rebel troops. They had been assigned to guard a hundred mile stretch of the Nashville and Chattanooga Railroad. At high noon, 
General Begley dispatched Joshua Pope with a wagon load of Betty Baker Peach cobbler pies, and he crossed over the river just past Cameron Hill. He told the Rams they had orders to deliver these pies compliments of the Confederate general, Master Josh to buy hat. He also delivered a note that he wasn't supposed to be able to read, which said that the Negro delivering these pies was a good boy but could be trusted and sent him back as soon as they were delivered. Then the story goes that just over one hour after that boy delivered them pies, a small division of the 79th Pennsylvania Volunteer crossed the ford atop Cameron Hill and found the Confederates spread out on the riverbanks like they was at ease. Says they all looked like they just ate Thanksgiving and couldn't have mustered an energy for a fight if they had to. They so surprised by the attack that only some few shots was even fired. They says that pie plates were scattered all up and down the river bank, and you could see peach marmalade on some of the lips. By nightfall, on Sunday, June 8th, in the year I lost, 1862, the city of Chattanooga had fell and was in the hands of the Union Army without so much as a cut on a Union soldier. Now, I don't know if we bring a dear general or ever actually thank them women. Now, I don't know if the Union Army ever give her her proper respect what we do. But what I does know is that President Lincoln and all these United States could never have won the city of Chattanooga if it weren't for Miss Betty Baker and her pie. Now, years and years later, when she was putting me a hundred, Miss Betty was asked what it was like to help win the city of Chattanooga. And her response was, well, honey, it was easy as pie. <laughs> Black women do what they meant, you know. I can't even do it. She looked back, she, she 
she was so disgusted, she did a double take and looked back at him. And it dawned on me that black women, especially professional black women, get a bum rap. Man, y'all cantankerous. You're making more money, and so you, you, you're intolerable, and you don't tolerate, and you got attitudes, and you just this and that and this and that. And, you know, I was, I was thinking about all that. And so I also went into downtown D.C., which is, I don't know if you know, but it's very gentrified. It used to be Chocolate City. No longer that way now. It's all kind of multi-ethnic, to say the least. And so I'm looking at the various women, and I observed really, literally, black women don't smile as often as white women, or Asian women, or any other ethnic women. They just don't. And so it dawned on me, and I went home that night, woke up the next morning with this poem as to the reasons why. Black women don't smile as often as other ethnic groups of women. It's entitled a black woman smile. Do you know how strong you have to be to make a black woman smile? Do you have any idea what an accomplishment that is? Because she has borne the weight of this country on her back for 400 years. She's been carrying the load of America in her belly since its infancy. She has suffered the agony of unassisted, husbandless child rearing since the 1600s. Have you any idea how much strength it takes to put a smile on her face? You need the strength of Samson, the nerve of Joshua, and the courage of David facing the life, because she has cultivated in her womb the marvel of the universe, only to have her hopes and dreams aborted and her aspirations show up. They don't arrive. She's given birth to kings and queens and delivered on her majestic promise only to have her children kidnapped and sold to a criminal with no respect for her royalty. If you can make a black woman smile, you are a miracle worker. Imagine breastfeeding your child in Virginia, having him snatched from your arms, branded, and hijacked to Louisiana and publicly fondled New Orleans auction block. If the memory of that pain was locked down in your DNA, would you be smiling? If you breastfed someone else's child only to watch her grow old enough to call you darky, pick a nanny, and nappy headed jigaboo, you wouldn't be smiling either. If you can make a black woman smile, you have done something. If you can make her smile, you are stronger than Atlas, because God knows she has been. She's been raped ravaged and scorned and nearly annihilated. She's been pimped, pummeled and stoned and deliberately depreciated. She has cooked and cleaned and sewn and never been compensated. She's been forced to watch the offspring of her loins mangled and maligned across centuries. Her character has been continuously smeared, assassinated over and over and over, again and again you ever thought about how strong you have to be just to be a black woman? She's had to make break without straw. After being stripped of all her customs, all her culture, and all her traditions, no other woman in the history of the civilized world has gone through what she's gone through. No other being on this planet has endured what she has endured. She's been chastised, criticized, demonized, and terrorized. She's had to stand. When her man was bull whipped for trying to stand. She's had to stand when her man was castrated for trying to stand. She's had to stand when her man was hung by his neck for trying to stand. She's had to carry her man. Because every time he tried to carry himself, he was murdered for trying to do so. Ask Betty Shabon about Malcolm. Ask Coretta Scott King about Mark. Ask Emmett Till's mother. Ask America Ever's wife. If you can make a black woman smile, you have achieved something. Since 1619, when we came in chains, the entire world's been messing with her brain, disrespecting her, calling her out of her name. And she's tired, just plain Fanny Lou Hamer tired, tired of being called B words, H words, N words, and other words, and everything except the child of God that she is. But there is one thing in this world that will make a black woman smile, and that's a man, a real man. If 
If you're doing what you're supposed to do, she'll smile. She'll smile regularly and gladly. So man up, my brother, man up. Make your woman smile. Treat her like the queen that she is. She deserves it. She deserves it. And recognize this. In all of God's creation, there is nothing more alluring, more appealing, more attractive. There's nothing more beautiful. There's nothing more charming, more charismatic, or captivating. There is nothing more delightful. There's nothing more elegant or exquisite. There's nothing more gorgeous. There's nothing more inspiring, more intoxicating, or invigorating. There is nothing more magnificent, nothing more lovely than a black woman's smile. Thing about that particular experience, and I was just telling uh, 
Charlie's mom, that uh, I believe that uh, the voices in my head are not all my voices. Um, I, I believe that there is the voice of God. Most of everything that I have ever read about intuition says that intuition is the voice of God. Everybody kind of agrees on that. Um, the question is, can you hear God? And uh, those of us that are artists, we study listening to God. We follow the instructions, we submit, and of course, uh, at the expense of being called eccentric and weird and strange, uh, we must do what we're told to do. And so as far as I'm concerned, those of us that are artists, we're the most highly favored king's kids. <laughs> and so at any rate, um, when I took the piece to Frederick Douglass, Museum and Cultural Center, it was the evening and the sun was setting and I asked them, I said, may I please go upstairs to the lookout? Now, if you guys are not familiar with this, his son built him a beach house in Highland Beach. Highland Beach originally was a, uh, a town in Arundel County, there's only two, there's Annapolis and there's Arundel, it's Highland Beach. And it was originally owned by, the whole area was owned by a uh, a white man and black people were not allowed to buy land there and ironically when he died he left the land to his wife when his wife died in her will she said she only wanted the land to be sold to black people <laughs> so I don't know what the dynamic was with their marriage but um, Highland Beach became a predominantly you know, now people are selling, so now it's much more diverse and it's integrated, but there was a time, uh, particularly at the beginning of the turn of the 20th century, um, all of the black bourgeois lived there. So Frederick Douglass' son bought a corner lot, and next to him was Paul Lawrence Dunbar's summer home, and uh, Mary Church Terrell was a neighborhood. You know, there's all these black elites were living in this neighborhood on the beach. So um, it's amazing, because I spent, uh, New Year's in the millennium in the neighborhood, but I didn't know that there was a beach there. I just happened to be visiting with some people. So when I, on New Year's Day, we happened to take a walk down by the water and it was for the house. It was ironic that this piece should be there. So one of the things that I uh, asked was, can I go upstairs? And so I went upstairs and there's this little lookout that his son had built because he wanted uh, to be able to look from the, uh, from the side where he was free across the Talbot County where he was a slave and, you know, just kind of <laughs> dissatisfied, you know. <laughs> Unfortunately, Frederick Douglass died before he had a chance to live in this house. So I go up to the lookout, and the lookout's very small. I mean, it wasn't even really as, a little bit bigger than this table. It's, you can only really get maybe two to three chairs on it. Just a little lookout. And I sat on the, the, the railing. And I said, so Fred, I call him Fred Baby, so Fred Baby. <laughs> you know, because I looked with him for quite a while. It was like, you know, I was reading his speeches and stuff. And so I said, so Fred Baby, are you happy? Because I thought that you were supposed to go on the northwest corner of Central Park. And I'm seeing that really you wanted to come home. So I hope that you're happy. I brought you home. I hope this is cool for you. So when I went downstairs, you know, I, um, I said to them, you know, take good care of them. So lo and behold, later they found the money and, you know, BT gave it to them, I made another one. So when I brought theirs to them, I said, can we make a deal? And they said, what would you like? I said, I'd like beach rights. I said, you know, I, I love the beach and, you know, whenever, I, I mean, can I come and go to the beach and can I use the house? So they said, yeah, sure, you know, we're next door, you know, just come by and get the keys and we'll let you have the house. I said, can I put a bed upstairs? And I was like, no, I can't do all that. But, you know, you can use the bathroom and stuff, you know, and you can park the car in the driveway and whatever. So that's what I do. So that summer, I was at the beach a lot. And near, uh, I would say, probably the middle of July, I went to the beach uh, one day with my cousin, and there was this woman planting a garden on the beach. And I'm nosy, so I walked over and I said, what are you, I mean, I, I see you're planting a garden, but why are you planting a garden on the beach? She said, oh, this is a rain garden. So like most people, I'm thinking, okay, so I'm assuming that it has something to do with the rain, but what does that mean? So she explained, you know, the whole thing, and she said, you know, the cool thing is that 
you're watching me do this, so you're going to get to see how it evolves because over the summer it's going to take and you're going to see how it, it's a very cool thing. Um, they're very uh, visually intriguing. I mean, they're literally depressions. You know, so normally sometimes you see like mounds for gardens. This is like a, a depression. And so if you are, and I'm sad to say that one of my boards, fourth board to see, there's one more. But basically, um, this rain garden was designed to have water running through it as well as to have depressions. And part of the reasons why we designed it that way is because um, if you're familiar with Phillips Manor Hall in Yonkers, there's the Larkham Plaza parking lot, which is uh, just, Okay, if you're looking at the river, at the bottom of the hill, there's the Yonkers Metro North, and then there's the parking lot, like a little like, uh, park, and then there's like, this parking lot, and then there's like an island. The island, which you might recognize, is shaped like that. The island is where the rain garden's going to go, but the parking lot, they're going to relight the Sawmill River, which is interesting. If you guys know anything about that area of Yonkers, the Sawmill River was originally two blocks wide from Dock Street all the way over to Main Street, and it became a sewage problem. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're talking about a, a, a river that had like triple waterfalls. It was gorgeous. I mean, when you see it, you're not even going to believe that they buried this thing. Um, but it is 23 feet below the surface, and now the city of Yonkers has decided they want to relight it. Well, in the process of their doing their homework, they realized that it's going to cost a lot of money to relight the original river, which is 23 feet, so they're going to create a fall river, so to speak. So what we wanted, the architect, uh, I'll tell you that story in a minute, the architect and I had a chat about what I wanted to see, and I said, I want them to look like they go together. You know, I don't want it to look like it's disconnected. So they hadn't designed the river walk yet, so we designed ours first. And um, when I made the presentation, the planning department says, we really like the way yours looks. It's softer. And I, you know, I said, I, I want it to be natural as if, you know, we're talking about the 16 and 1700s. I don't want trash receptacles. You know, I don't want metal benches. I don't want this. I, I want mostly for it to be like, for instance, I don't know if you guys are, are aware uh, in Westchester, are you guys into rock walls? I love rock walls. The, the Native Americans and the African Americans built walls throughout Westchester. If you're ever a passenger coming down the sawmill from, let's say, um, uh, Bedford, and if you're going south, on the right, if you just keep looking out the window, you're gonna see these walls going along, like in the woods, you'll see walls. Um, all over Westchester, Largemont, mm -hmm. um, Everywhere in Westchester, if you guys really start looking, you're going to see these walls that are literally made of stone, the old-fashioned way, rock by rock by rock. The Native Americans and the slaves built these walls. And so I said, I want that effect because I like rock walls. Not to mention that there's already a walk, rock wall that exists, and I said, I don't want to discard those rocks, I want to repurpose them. So that's part of how you know, we came up with this vision. Um, I want to back it up a little bit. Um, I, I began sculpting because I had a painter block. I'm a painter. And um, one day I had what I call my out-of-body experience, and I realized I had not painted anything for seven years. And this was a major concern for me, because when you're in your 30s, when you talk about increments of seven and 10, it's a lot. And so to not paint for seven years blew me, because I was like, how did I not know that I had not been I was busy, I was working, you know, you get out of college, you get work, you gotta make money, and although I was doing creative stuff, I'm a little kid that used to draw every day, I used to paint every day, and it occurred to me that maybe my malcontent was tied to my not making what I call fine art. And so a year went by, and I was trying to figure out what to, to, to do to get myself to paint, and nothing was happening. And so I ran into a girlfriend, because I used to braid hair when braiding hair first became in vogue in the 70s and 80s. And she asked me what I was painting, and she mentioned that her husband was a potter. And so I thought that I was going to be learning pottery. And when he showed up at my house, we had agreed that I would pay him $50 for two hours. 
um, he came with sculpting tools. And like everybody else, I'm like, well, so how do you do that? I mean, how do you get the metal? I mean, how does that work? And so he left me with a 50-pound block of clay and some tools. And four days later, I had a sculpture, and I was bang zoom to the moon. You know, I was like, come, I need to come see what I made. Oh my god, oh my god, I was freaking out. And so that winter, I made five sculptures, and I didn't know what I was doing. By the fifth month, I was a basket case. Uh, people that know me know that I'll cry in a heartbeat, and in those days, my voice would start to rise, and it would get very high pitched, and of course, I'd break out in tears because I was sculpting in clay, and I was losing them, literally. Clay is basically dust and water, and when the water evaporates, it turns back to dust. I lost Malcolm X and his daughter twice. People keep saying, are you going to do it again? And I'm like, I don't know if I can do it again. I want to, but I don't know if I can convince myself to do it again. I say, yeah, disintegrate it. I mean, you know, start off with a crack. And then, you know, this piece, you go to pick this piece up to try to see if you can move it. It just kind of crumbles on your hand. It's like, oh, man. So a lot of interesting things happened that year. I think um, the first major thing happened, I, at that time I was writing for the newspaper. I was a newspaper column. Of course, everybody knew me, uh, you know, because you have a picture with your bylaw and stuff. And so there was this woman who um, wanted me to join uh, a group of artists who were trying to create a nonprofit. And I was looking for people for my planet. And so uh, to cut to the chase, she wanted to know how are you teaching yourself to sculpt? Nobody does that. I've been a teacher for 25 years, and nobody does yeah. that. And I'm like, I'm just trying to tell you how it's happening for me. She said, but that, that does not how, that's not how it works. I'm like, that's how it's happening. For me. So she wanted to know, well, what books are you reading? I'm like, I'm not reading any books. She says, you don't have any books. I said, I have one book. I said, I'm not able to find any books. I have one book. Who's it, who's it by? Bruno Lucchese. Oh my God. I, I know him. I used to. Well, anyway, long story short, uh, she knew Bruno Lucchese. And she said, do you want to meet him? Now, Bruno Lucchese, if you don't know who he is, is a world famous Italian. Sculpture. If you go into any major museum, I mean like the Met, the Corcoran, whatever. If you go to the bookstore, he's in there. I mean, like several times, different books. He's, he's pretty cool. So she said, let me see if he remembers me. I'll call him and see whether or not he'll see you. So she calls me and says, he remembers me. You know, we have an appointment on Tuesday. And so I roll up in there, and his studio, I'm telling you, is about the size of the floor plan of this gallery like this. He had three life-size sculptures, in progress, in play, everything in the book was there, and the beauty, of course, was like, oh my god, look at the bag. I mean, I'm freaking out at the door. And so, long story short, she's saying to him, don't you think she needs to go to school? Don't you think she needs to study anatomy? Don't you think she needs to study art history? And he's shaking his head, no, 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 no. And she's like, well, why not? And he says, because they'll ruin her. They'll want her to be doing what they're doing, and she only has an eye. Leave her alone. And so Barbara, this is Barbara Siegel, you know, my best girl. So Barbara lays out pictures of my five sculptures. She lays them out, and he picks them up, and he lays them out again. And I'm like, how'd you do that? And he says, what? I said, you lay them out in order that I made them. He says, I can tell in the order that you made them. I said, but how can you tell? He said, I can see it. He said, isn't this the order? And I said, yes, it is. And so long. Long, very long story. Um, he says to me at some point, he's apologizing because he had aphasia, he had a stroke, and uh, I'm looking at him and I can see this. His eyes don't blink and sink, and you know, one side of his mouth is crooked or whatever. And he's apologizing to me, and I'm saying, that's not what I came here for. I, I want to know who lives inside you. Why do you do this? This makes me feel nuts. I'm crying. I'm having a fit. I need. $35,000, I'm not making $35,000. And of course, I start to cry. And I'm poking him, like, who lives in there? What is this? You know, I said, my parents are artists. They don't have to make, I feel like I'm going to die if I don't do this. And he says, oh, that's easy. He said, the goal is to see better. I'm like, what does that mean? He says, the goal is to see better. Doesn't something happen between one and two and two? Doesn't something happen like every time you make something in between pieces? Like, doesn't it come faster? Doesn't it come easier? Doesn't it flow? Don't you feel something? I said, yes, yes, I do. He said, that's what it's about. That's all it's about. Don't worry about the money. I'm like, yeah, right, easy for you. So I said to him, I said, you know what? I said, I tell you what. I said, God came to me today and said, look, you know, I've been watching you, really love you, but you're boring me. You know, here you go. 
gonna change it. You're gonna do something else completely. You're gonna love this. You're gonna make you be able to sculpt. No ramp up time, just gonna start. People are gonna love your stuff, they're gonna buy your stuff. Uh, you know, you'll have a home in Italy, you'll go back and forth. Your child will be amazing. I said, and in your 68th year, I'm going to have a little project to be working on. I'm going to need a few muscles out of your face. You can keep your hands. I'll let you live another 30 years. You'll be fine. He starts to cry. And I said, oh, come on, don't be a sport. sport. You've had a great, that's a great deal, that's a great deal. He's, he's like, oh, no, you don't know. I said, no, no, I'm telling you, it's a great deal. I said, you are me, but you got the deal 10 years earlier. He was a shepherd herding sheep in Italy, and his parents gave him the opportunity that herd sheep or go to school. He said, I don't want to herd sheep, he goes to school. He had never been taught this stuff, he just started. People started buying the stuff, and next thing you know, I mean, you know, the rest is history. I said, come on. I said, you had a great life. Don't be such a spoiled sport. So he hugs me, he says, no, no, you're right, you're right. So I'm hanging with Barbara, and we're creating on our main street, Yonkers, and uh, we go to the city, and we say we should get married. We want the same things. You want culture. We want culture. You know, let the artists create the downtown waterfront district. Let us give us money. We'll do stuff with the money. So what did we do? We created the Stone Garden. Are you all familiar with the Stone Garden on the river in Yonkers? Yeah. Originally, that was nine sculptures. We got fifty thousand dollars. We begged for fifty thousand pounds of stone. We gave nine kids jobs for the summer, working with nine artists to have the opportunity to learn stone carving. The editor for the New York Times was going by, going to work, trying to figure out what are they doing. One day he got off the train to see what they were doing, and he put a full page article on it. And that's when the city learned that art could be good PR. So I wrote a proposal to do Ella. I said, you don't have anything in Yonkers but dead presence and war heroes. I think you should have something that's more representational of the community. You know, Ella is a, an international music icon. She spent her entire childhood here. You don't have anything for women. You don't have anything for artists. You don't have anything for people of color. I think you should do it. And they said, yes. Yeah. So hi, Ella's at the Metro North train station. It was my first public artwork. Um, she died while I was working on the piece. It made the piece relevant. More importantly, I think that what the city learned from that piece is that people really cared about that public artwork. I'm living in Maryland. People call me to tell me that every year someone puts a red scarf on her for Christmas and they put a pink scarf on her for Valentine's Day. And it's the same scarf. Nobody removes it. You know, they're calling me and telling me, oh, Mary J. Blige and DMX and, you know, all the people who are now famous from Yonkers, when they come to Yonkers, they go to get their pictures taken with Ella. I'm like, does anybody have these pictures? Because I'd like to see them, but yeah, I get the call, you know? <laughs> anyway, uh, in 2008, fast forward, you know, Hofstra University uh, commissions me to do Frederick Douglass. Uh, we have debate on weight, Obama and McCain. And uh, my daughter gets into Parsons University School of Design. She meets the 10th power, and I'm thrilled. And when she declares that she wants to go to school in New York, I'm like, I'm going home too. You're not leaving me. So, you know, I had the opportunity to transition back. Commission's over, and I'm thinking, I gotta do something else. Because all my bills doubled, literally, everything. Rent, car insurance. Just so you know, we got full tuition at Parsons. We pay more than $5,000 a semester for fees. It's been three years, I still don't know what fees are. I really don't, I called the woman hemmed and hawed, and I said, if you don't know, just tell me you don't know, and I'll write the check on Friday. She said, I really don't know. I said, fine, I'll send you a check on Friday. I, I've been doing it for five semesters. I really don't know what fees are, but she's there, and she's working it, and that's all I care about. But meanwhile, it's February 2009, Black History Month is almost over, and I'm a little upset with myself because I haven't gone to anything all month, and I'm thinking, you know, I should go to some program. I mean, I just, you know, I went to historically black school, and you know, I like to uh, support black programs, and I look for them, and sometimes I get busy, and I just don't get to go. And so City Councilwoman Patricia McDowell was having an event at the City Hall, and like, it's the 27th of February, I don't have any more time, I should just go. So I'm there, 
you know, people are like, oh, maybe you're back, we heard you back. Oh, so I see you have some kisses. And she starts her program, and she's going on about what she's going on. And I'm standing there, and all of a sudden, I hear her say, and Vinnie Bagwell will be creating a public artwork to honor the enslaved. And she goes to this thing, and I'm like, anybody else hear that? And I'm nobody else, I mean, nobody's responding. She's, I'm just like, did she say that? You ever have that happen where you're wondering if you're now like, in the twilight zone? Because So when it's over, I sidle up to her, and I said, are you, well, that's not what I said, but I was like, are you kidding? Or, you know, are you, are you just, what are you doing? And she says, I'll talk to you later. I'm like, okay. So I come for lunch. Yeah, I'm over in 66 minutes. Come for lunch. I'll make you lunch. We'll talk about this. So she comes two days later, and we're sitting knee to knee on the couch, and she's talking to me about the film smell. Oh, now it's funny. I was born in Yonkers. I went to school there through fourth grade. I lived there for 17 years before I moved away, and I live there again now. And I know the film smell, but I somehow do not recall knowing that the Phillips family was the largest slave trader in the country, second behind South Carolina. I just didn't know that. That's so true. I didn't know that. So I'm like, really? She said, yeah, you should go over there and check out the exhibition that's there. So you should know, this exhibition that's along the wall, this is the exhibition that's in the Phillips Marrow Hall. You should know, it's been there since 2006. Yeah. Most of the people that I know don't ever think to go to the Phillips Marrow Hall because the place is almost invisible because we take it for granted, and most people went there in fourth grade, and you know, by the time you're 20, 30, 40, 50, you don't really think or remember the thing from fourth grade, so it's, it just becomes irrelevant. So I said to her, I said, wait, let me make sure I got this right. You want me to do this? She said, yeah. I said, this is my project. She said, yes. I said, so wait, if I do this project and get it going, you're not gonna snatch it back and give it to somebody else, are you? No. I said, okay, fine, I'll do it. I said, now if you give it to me, I'm going to do it. She said, no, it's yours, do it. I said, okay, fine. So I started to research. I write for a living. Um, as I said, I've, I've been a newspaper uh, columnist. I uh, write grant proposals on a regular basis. I write for competitions. I write a lot. And in the process of uh, competing and things like that, I have to research a lot. So I'm researching, and you know, God bless the, the internet. And the first thing that I learned is that the enslaved Africans who lived at Phyllis Manor Hall, six of them were among the first to be freed by law in the country, and it was 76 years before the Emancipation Proclamation. I'm thinking, why does anybody talk about this? So I contact the Board of Education, and no, it's not in the curriculum. I'm like, okay, that's good. So, you know, I began to do what I do, which is I start to get what I call consensus. I start talking to everybody to find out what does everybody know or not know so I can get a sense of relativity. And I'm thinking, nobody knows this stuff. This is good. This, for me, this is good because this means I'm going to be introducing something that's going to be new and exciting and relevant. And I'm telling you, people are going to care about this. So I make an appointment with the mayor. Now, he knows me because I wrote a very nice article on him, like way before he became the mayor. So it's like, hi, hugs, kisses. And I'm telling him this story, and he's listening, and he's like, I like this. I said, no, no, it's not about you liking it. I want you to understand that this is what you guys like to call economic development. You know, the thing that fill the dreams, build it, they will come. I'm telling you, if you build it, they will come. People will come to New York City, and they will take a train ride 33 minutes north to Yonkers, see the enslaved Africans' rain garden, eat at the restaurants, buy the liquor, go to the post office, I mean, it's going to make a big difference. And he was like, okay. So he blessed it. So I said to Pat, I said, well, what do you want to see? She says, I want to see a family. I said, okay, so what's your idea of a family? She said, four or five people. I said, five is a better number than four. She said, okay. So I said, okay, let's talk about the breadth of slavery. We're talking about old people beautiful people, pregnant people, it doesn't matter. You know, if they catch you, you're, you're on. I said, so, I said, I'm gonna make five people, I said, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do a iconic woman, which turned out to be Isati, the one with the buck on her head. She was the first piece that I made, and, you know, I wanted people to recognize her immediately. If they were in the car driving by and they saw this woman, they'd be like, who does this? This exhibition will travel. Uh, the next stop, we hope, will be the Hudson River Museum. Uh, we 
we are waiting for a confirmation. We do not have a date, uh, but when we do, if you would please uh, double check the website from time to time. It's the enslaved Africans Raingarden.org. Uh, if you check it, this presentation and other things that we do will be on the website. So uh, it will be what we call interactive. It, it won't be static. Stuff will continue to show up there and you'll find out what's going on. Um, I'd like to reiterate that this project, um, these are what we call maquettes. This is third scale. In other words, they're supposed to be life-sized. We need the money to make them be life-sized. That is not a given. The mayor for the city of Yonkers has expressed his commitment uh, to creating the rain garden, but the city of Yonkers cannot do it by themselves. It's a lot of money, a lot, a lot of money. And so uh, what we are hoping is that folks will uh, gift us generously. Uh, generous is relative. If you got $5, we'll take your $5. $500, we'll take that too. Um, you can give online, you can write a check, we'll take cash, it doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be today, but you need to understand that if you do not see it happen in a timely manner, it is because we have not received your money. Does anybody have any questions before we end today? I'll take questions. Anybody have anything that I'd like to ask? sold until after the enlargements are done. Um, as a rule, you know, a lot of times when I compete for public art, and it depends on whose uh, commission it is, but usually the rule is you do not sell the maquette until the public artwork is complete. And some folks are funny. They don't want the maquettes sold, and they don't want the art reproduced anywhere within 100 miles of wherever it's going to be. So no, in this particular instance, um, we have a down payment plan. If you want to start uh, putting some money down on a mad cap, we finally get them finished in the next three plus years, you can send us a check, we'll take your money. Um, but I'm just simply saying that no, at this time, uh, these five people are not for sale. Uh, we are trying to create the life-size people and that is the priority for this project at this time. Any other questions? We are looking, you know, we're going to do this like you eat an elephant. You know, the joke says, how do you eat an elephant? It's like you eat it piece by piece. You don't eat it whole. Um, so when we say that this is a multi-million dollar project, uh, we don't need, you know, a million dollars to start it. I think that we'll be doing this in quarters. We need to find the first $250,000. Um, an enlargement has to be created. The sculpture has to be uh, refined. It has to be molded. It has to be cast. Um, each of these pieces, if I did not have a finance issue, uh, each piece would take approximately six months to create. I am creating a public artwork for the city of Memphis right now. It's a six-foot Native American woman. The maquette's in the vault. If you guys have not been in the vault, uh, please take a peek in there before you leave. Um, Legacies, uh, the enlargement was created this summer. I started on it in May. She just left my house last week. It doesn't take me long to make these. I can make them faster than I can make the money. Um, so it's really a question of how fast the money to start shows up. As I said, the uh, planning department uh, is intending to uh, give another grant uh, for the next funding cycle. The question is, how many pennies will they give for that project? I don't know that it'll be enough to start the first enlargement. It may be the beginning. It may be something to get me started. It may allow me to create the sculpture, but I cannot have a plastilina hanging around in my house for a year or two to life-size. Isati, who is going to be, what, eight feet with the bucket on her head? 
I'm not going to have an eight-foot woman stand in my living room for a couple of years while I'm trying to find mold-making money. And so, um, you know, I am a grant writer. I wrote the grants to find the money to get these done. I'm the artist. That really should be somebody else's job, but it's not, so it's my job. I will continue to look for funding. I will continue to write grants and to compete and to try to win the money. But if the money doesn't come like that, then the people are going to have to take some responsibility for helping. And this is the purpose of this exhibition, to make people aware of what the intent is for this project and hopefully to inspire them to want to participate in making it become a reality. Yes. Yes, the pieces in the wall are for sale. Um, there is a price list if you're curious to know how much is Frederick Douglass, how much is sunlight in my father's eyes. Uh, yes, they are for sale. Um, oftentimes, when people find out what the real numbers are, it's like, ooh, that's a lot of money. You know, we have what we laughingly refer to as the installment plan. You can leave a deposit. You can, you know, piece it together over the course of time. Um, because for most people to spend $5,000, $15,000, $30,000, that's competing with, well, college education, it's competing with the down payment on a home, it's competing on a real nice vacation for like a family, that's competing for a big screen TV, I mean it's competing with a lot of stuff and unfortunately in this country most people are not steeped in art, you know, Americans don't feel about art very much the way, let's just say, Europeans do, so, um, you know, People will love an artwork, but sometimes when I start to talk about the dollars, I see their eyes glaze over and sometimes they pivot. Anybody else? The name of the website again? Frederick Douglass Art Museum. This is the Enslaved Africans, there's no apostrophe in the uh, website, it's just AfricansRainGarden.org. Or if you Google Vinnie Bagwell, it will come up as well. You may also find me on Facebook. Um, Facebook has been a phenomenal, phenomenal experience. I've had a Facebook page for a year, and uh, as I said, I met Ty Rael on Facebook through somebody in London. I, was, I don't know if you were there last night, but I was uh, talking about my webmaster. We just uh, made it so that we can now figure out who's going to the website, and in the last week we've had 400 people come to the website from seven different countries. Mm -hmm. um, people all over the world are learning about this project and are caring about the project. It is a marvelous, marvelous thing when somebody in Africa writes me in French, does not speak English, and wants to talk to me about this project. And I have to translate in my computer from English to French to have a conversation for a half an hour about how they feel about it. It's a marvelous, marvelous experience. I'm going to have to write a book just about Facebook. Um, but it's, it's interesting to hear how, well, the people from Africa feel about this project. You know, we're African Americans, and we think about the people who lived here. What we don't think about is the people who were left there, and how losing Millions of people from your country impacts your culture and the history of how your country continues to evolve. It's been very interesting, uh, and I say listening because you know we're talking um, to their emotion about how we want to honor them as well as us. We're, they they say they say to me that they call me Replendent Queen. They call me. Uh, you know, most honorable, I mean, they, they bow and kowtow to me, which I find really, really amusing, but it's very nice um, to be acknowledged that way, and um, it, the love is just immense, you know, the emotion is just immense. I mean, if you were to go to my website, you got time to just read some of the comments, the things that people from other countries say to me. I, my last jury, I had somebody, uh, 
talking to me in what I thought was Spanish. And I'm trying to translate it, and it wasn't translating. And finally, I said to them, no hablo español, you know, como. And they said, Portuguese. Yeah. I was like, oh! And so, <laughs> put it so next thing I'm talking Portuguese to somebody in Peru. Um, you know, and again, the, the, the artwork has tremendous mass appeal across cultural, global lines. That is amazing to me. It's not just my good idea. Um, there are a lot of people that are very, very, very passionate about this project. And it's, it's interesting when the online contributions come in, because I get to know exactly who, where, what, everything. I get all the information, and usually I respond directly to people directly. I write them a personal note and say thank you so much for caring about me, and thank you for caring about my artwork, and thank you for caring about the importance of this project. It's going to be phenomenal when it becomes enlarged in the world. I cannot wait to live that long. Yes. Thank you very much for I looked at the uh, at your website, and it's true. Such beautiful comments uh, were mentioned about it. I just had to come and see it for myself. I was so touched about. Um, I just want to know what inspired you when you got into that. How, and it does seem like a divine project and a, it's a divine. One thing I wanted to say too, which really touched me, I'm uh, on the board of directors of Westchester Disabled on the Move, and when I saw that some of the inscriptions were in Braille, yeah. I said. I'm going to a convention uh, October 5th and 6th up in Albany. I definitely would mention your exhibit. Oh, and um, maybe, we don't know, sometimes uh, the contributions may come from unlikely sources. But uh, It's divine. I had a woman yes. who has a four-year-old who's losing his sight. She starts a conversation with me and she wants to know why do I put Braille on there and I'm telling about my mother and I'm telling her I spent my, I spent eight years at the New York Eye and Ear Infirmary from age six on it, trying to improve my vision. My mother took me up and down. She tells, she tells people how I used to go there by myself on the train at eight years old on the subway to go to the eye doctor every yeah. month. And this woman is telling me how her, her son has some sort of congenital disease and he's literally, he's four losing his sight and she is taking him to a special school to learn Braille and she's crying, she's starting to cry. And she's telling me, you know, how she thinks it's so sensitive that I've incorporated this into my uh, project. And I had to say, you know, thank you, but I'll be honest with you, I like the way it looks. Mm -hmm. I can see it. I like the way it looks as a pattern. Mm -hmm. I said, but on the other side, what I also understand is that for somebody like her and her child, it means more. Yes. And so the idea of, with this project was to try to incorporate as much, as many different kinds of communication systems as possible. So for instance, one of the things that I didn't talk about uh, in this exhibition, because I haven't finished making up my mind, is that there'll be text and pavement. For those of you that know my Frederick Douglass, there's text and pavement. I, I love that affect. I'm still trying to decide what am I going to say in text and pavement. For instance, um, has anybody here been to the, uh, uh, the African Burial Garden, the African Burial Grounds New Visitation Center? Anybody been there yet? Oh, you guys. Oh, yeah. You gotta go. They just opened this spring the, you all know it. Everybody, does everybody here know about the enslaved uh, you know, burial ground in Manhattan? Yes. You all know about this? Okay. You don't know about this? What time are you living on? This is, she's from San Francisco. Oh, what time are you living on? Oh, dark 30. You have to come back, okay? Mm -hmm. um, in Manhattan, just for information for anybody else to know, in Manhattan, in the late Actually, it was the mid-90s, there was an African-American construction team digging the foundation for the General Services Administration building in Lower Manhattan. They started finding bones, lots of bones. Now, okay, what disturbed them, you know, it's an African-American construction team that won this, you know, this um, bid 
to dig them, just they, they're just building the foundation, that's the only job they have. They're finding African, clearly African artifacts that let them know these, these gotta be Africans, because look at the stuff that we're finding with them. I mean, bone, turn out to be 418 people. The people in Brooklyn, because this is right next to the entrance to the Brooklyn Bridge, the people in Brooklyn and the people in Lower Manhattan, mind you, David Dinkins is my cousin. He was the mayor at the time. They had a temper tantrum down there at City Hall, Gracie Mansion, and said, you have got to stop them. You've got to stop. You can know you cannot dig any further. We want Howard University's archaeological team to come and do this dig. You cannot know. Stop. I mean, they carried on terribly and so long and behold, they had when GSA had to contract Howard University mm -hmm. to come and dig up these people. They had them in boxes, in lockers, in a gym. The people were having a fit. I mean, it was a major thing in the mid-90s, okay? So ultimately, all the bodies were excavated. They were taken to Howard University. Howard University studied them for five years so we could learn who are they. Most of them were children. Most of them. More than, I forget what the percentage was, but it was more than 30% of them were children. Of course, then they had to admit that they knew there were African burial grounds in Manhattan. The other one is underneath Trump Tower up by Broadway. I mean, you know, they got to bury the black people somewhere. The question is, where are they? It was on the documents at City Hall, but who looks at these things? So the GSA, which is a federal organization, general service, they made a concession and said, okay, this is what we're going to do. We're going to give you a good section of the land, we're going to read to this, and we're going to let you bury these people back here. We're going to give you money, we're going to create a million dollar public art project, and we're going to create a visitation center. So they had a contest, I was in the contest, the contest went on for more than five years, and as I said at the beginning of this discussion, I didn't win, I didn't get a notice until I heard that they were building it, somebody else won. I had to go down there because I'm black, I wanted to see well, what did they do. It is what is better known as architectural. When you hear architectural, that means abstract. If you were to go there, let's say if we went there like this afternoon, it's a Saturday, and let's say the visitation center is closed at the five o'clock, if you were some other, from some other planet, you would have no clue what an African looks like. Because it's what? It's architectural, it's very nice. So when they created the visitor center, someone told me, people email me all the time, said you've got to go, it's Sunday, you gotta go. The, the opening was on Saturday. I couldn't find anybody to go with me. My cousin Craig, who's taking pictures around here somewhere, hi, hi, Craig, let's go. So we went on Sunday the next day, and frankly it was better the next day because it wasn't so crowded because we were concerned about millions of people being there. We went, it was very civilized. What I loved about it is that it's, and you all have to go, it's not that large, but it's beautifully done. I mean, it make you proud. You walk and be like, this is off the chain. It's awesome. At the center of this permanent exhibition, there is a wax sculpture of a woman comforting a child. Now, mind you, I'm raised well. I'm like this. I'm not touching. I'm looking at fingernails because I like details. I'm looking, I'm looking at eyelashes. I'm looking at, I want to touch her because she, they look real. If you all ever been to a wax museum, they look real, but they're inside. They also incorporate, I mean, they did a lot of different things with the visual presentation for this particular visitation center, but one of the things that intrigued me, text and pavement, when you, when you go inside the building, um, in the lobby way, they have this uh, terrazzo floor, and in the floor, they have all of the African languages. There's a bunch of them. They have all the African languages. Then they have words in African. They have translation. They got French, because a lot of, of people in Africa speak French. They got, and, Craig and I are walking around and we're talking about what we think the language aspect of it is about. And I'm like, I want that. I want that because I want anybody that comes to this, no matter where they're coming from, they might see their language there. I have 
have so many stories. I, I'm walking down on the Hudson River. I have two dogs. One of them I carry, the other one walks on the leash. I'm walking down to the river and there is this man singing to the river. One Saturday afternoon. Singing to the river. And so I'm standing back. I mean, he's like from here to there. And I'm standing back and I'm listening to him. And he's doing this whole thing, singing to the river. Now, if you ever go down to the Hudson River in Yonkers, you'll find young men doing capoeira, which is a kind of um, uh, martial art dance. I mean, you find people doing all kinds of things. Some men, but this man is singing to the river. And I find that my feeling about people that I meet now, nobody's random now. I mean, hi, you're not random, you know. My point. I wait for him to finish, and I approach him, and I say, I hope he speaks English, and I say to him, excuse me, where are you from? And he starts to talk, and I'm talking about my, my project, and he turns out to be from Nigeria, and he's telling me what he's saying to the river, and the whole night, he turns out to be a pastor at the YWCA. Okay, here's another one. I'm in the Scriptex Pharmacy. I'm looking for smooth move tea. Which you can find at Whole Foods, in case you wonder. And I'm looking around, and this man, I saw him see me, but I'm ignoring him because I'm really looking for the tea. And he sees me, and he says to me, you must be looking for me. And I turn to him, and I say, not yet. And I walk around, and he's watching me. I can see him watching me. And so finally, I come past him, and he says, I'm telling you, you must be looking for me. And I said, hold on just one second. I just want to look at this right here. I'm going to talk to you. So I look where the teas are, and they don't have smooth move tea at the script text. So finally I said to him, because I love people that jig with me, I said, where are you from? And he puts his chin up and he says, Nigeria. I said, do you speak Igbo? What do you know about Igbo? And I said, I asked God last week to send me somebody who speaks Igbo because I need somebody to proofread my, my prayer. I'm not going to tell you the whole story because we're trying to go home. But 
Um, at some point, I said in my presentation that I went to a historically black college, and every day at Morgan State University, their mantra was excellent. We were told that we could not study mediocrity, that we had to represent the race, that we had to work harder, that, that we always had to be about excellence. And I mean, I, we heard it literally every day. For four years, I heard this, and I believed it because it was, a, I thought, a very valuable lesson to learn. And I, I say this to my daughter all the time. My point is that years ago, when I was writing for uh, Gannett, for the Herald Statesman, um, I heard that W.C. Handy's daughter uh, lived in the house in Yonkers. And I went to her, and they were going through litigation, and um, she didn't want to talk to me. But later, she came back, and long story short, Linda Class and I are now friends, very old, good friends. I remembered that W.C. Handy um, was declared the father of the blues a hundred years ago last year. And I started researching and nobody was doing anything for him. So I wrote a grant to create a sculpture for him for the Yonkers Library. The Arts Council gave me a $5,000 